This presentation is about practical edge inferencing, enabling the fastest AI inferences per watt, leveraging sparsity. There are three key aspects I would love for you to take back from this presentation. Number one, what do we define as practical edge inferencing and hence, what do we mean by the fastest AI inferences per watt? Number two, how do we achieve it? And number three, how do you benefit from this? How do end users leverage the benefits of what we offer? So let's get started. Let's get started with what's practical. As we've worked with a number of customers and partners with Gray One, our first silicon, there are three key aspects that have emerged. Number one, programmability, the ability to take existing TensorFlow models or PyTorch models and map them to your hardware with minimum changes. Number two, flexibility in terms of the interfaces you support and hence the systems that you're able to attach yourself to, the kinds of sizes that you can ingest, and the types of sensors that you're able to accommodate when connecting your hardware. And last but not least is the performance. And of course, what is interesting about performance is that end users actually care about system performance. It's not just about the benchmark performance of standard networks like ResNet or MobileNet SSD, but rather how does the performance of the end system improve when using your solution? So let's also define fastest AI per watt. When we at Gray Matter Labs look at fastest AI, we refer to latency. That is the time it takes for an inference from an input frame to an output. We want to minimize this time and hence the latency of inference. Even though systems may offer a very high throughput in terms of frames per second, that same system may not be able to offer the lowest latency that's possible. We want to, of course, offer this low latency with very high efficiency. And that's what we mean by performance per watt. And hence, as an objective for our system, we maximize the performance as in lower the latency per unit watt of energy that you consume. So how do you achieve this? Let's start with typical edge data systems. What you see there is the input from a camera perspective, a security camera, for example. The first frame has a number of pixels defined by its resolution. But as you look at the next frame, there's very little that has actually changed, which is the bicycle has moved from point A to point B, which means that the information content of this frame has gone down substantially. The changes are sparse, they're highly localized, and so they're correlated in space and time. This is a key feature of edge systems. Now, traditional accelerators don't take advantage of this. What I mean by that is what you see in this picture here. Every pixel that comes into the system is processed almost mindlessly, and the entire neural network is crunching away at information frame after frame after frame. To us, that's a huge waste of power and resources. So how do we change that? Well, we transform this AI compute with what we define as sparse compute. The idea is that you want to process only the changes that come in. So what you see in the bottom is that the difference between the first frame and the next frame results in computations that are only necessary that's defined by the change that's occurred. And this happens not only at the input, but also at the processing side of things. So we are able to leverage the sparsity in the input by processing only the aspects that have changed. This type of computation we call sparse compute and it takes advantage of sparsity in space, in time, 
in the connections and in activation. We combine this with an in-memory compute and the way we define in-memory compute is shown in this picture, which is the memory is distributed across the entire chip. And so all the operations that are occurring happen right next to the memory. This allows for the sparsity that we are leveraging to be extremely efficient by using what we define as persistent neuron memory. It also scales very easily to large core counts. So in summary, neuron flow technology is a combination of three architectural pillars. Dynamic data flow, which exploits this data dependent sparsity at the edge, as in process only the changes that are coming in. Digital neuromorphics, which enables a scalable cost efficient silicon design. So nothing exotic, which allows us to take advantage of, you know, the process nodes that are available to the entire industry. And of course, finally, in-memory compute, which reduces the power consumption and latency. When you combine these three aspects, you're able to offer over 100x opportunities in savings. We have designed our first processor, which is called Gray One. It's a pure accelerator and it's designed in 28 nanometer process node. It's about 20 millimeters square and it's fully programmable with standard SDK that comes with this. It's self-contained as a system, which means that there's no external DRAM access to extract any of the weights or aspects of the neural network. But in addition, you can not only program neural networks, but also DSP instructions. This gets enabled through our SDK, which is the Grayflow SDK. So as mentioned before, you can take a standard TensorFlow network, map it to our hardware, or you can use a compute API to map DSP instructions. All this is available with a functional simulator. So you can profile the functions and then go ahead and map it to the hardware. So of course, in order to map it to the hardware, do, we do provide a, a hardware development kit or HDK as it's called. This allows you for you to develop proof of concepts or POC with the gray one. So let's look at how you can achieve this latency using gray one or the lowest latency that's possible. So one of the networks that we've been running on the gray one is PilotNet. This network allows you to offer a steering angle for a car that's moving on a road. So as the picture shows you, the setup is such that we observe the road, which is through the camera. The frames are sent to gray one and the differences are processed by gray one to produce an output, which is the steering angle. The sparsity level in this case tends to be very high in the order of 95% or more because not much is changing between frame to frame. What you can see in this picture here is that if we were to process the entire frame as in every pixel all the time, it would take us about 40 milliseconds per frame. On the other hand, if we just look at what's changing, which is the sparse frame, the latency for that processing is on average two milliseconds. There is a distribution as you see for the inferences because it is dependent on the level of changes that occur from frame to frame. But overall, the distribution is quite narrow and the mean is around two milliseconds, which gives you almost a 20 times faster inference latency performance. So, the key aspect that I wanted to demonstrate with this is that traditional accelerators, even though may have a high throughput, may not result in low latency. And that's shown on the right, which is in this example, a hundred frames per second camera, which is sending a frame every 10 milliseconds, may result in an output every 10 milliseconds and hence a high throughput. However, the time between your input to the output may not necessarily be 10 milliseconds and may be defined by the latency of that specific architecture, which can be in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. 
On the other hand, with gray matter labs, you're able to offer an inference in the order of milliseconds. So essentially, you're done processing that frame very fast and hence use the time that's available for the system to process anything that goes beyond the inference and improve the overall system latency. So why does this matter? If you're able to reduce the latency of your system, you can provide a much higher productivity to the entire system. Let's see an example. So as, as you've seen in the case of PilotNet, it's a car that's driving on a road. So if you're able to reduce the latency, you actually can translate that to a much higher speed for the car. So on the bottom, what you see is a full frame mode operation, which can run up to nine miles per hour at a max with two frames per second of a camera input. And at 10 miles per hour, the car crashes. Whereas on the top left-hand side, you can run in sparsity mode, hence reduce the latency, which means that the car can run much faster and at a higher frame rate from the camera. So to see this, let's look at the car at the bottom. The car is now trying to achieve 10 miles per hour by running in full frame mode and it ends up crashing. So it is not able to maneuver that turn that you see. On the other hand, if I'm able to run a sparse mode, I'm done with the calculations much faster, which means that I can run at a much higher speed. So not only can I maneuver that curve in a much better way, but I can increase my speed and hence improve my overall performance as a system. So in summary, if you're able to offer latency benefits in terms of how fast you can run your inference, you can provide a much higher productivity to your end system. Now, where these matter are systems which are closed loop systems by nature. So things like, of course, cars, which we just saw, but industrial automation, robotics, drones, AR, VR, and so on. So anywhere there's a closed feedback system loop that relies on the input to make some decisions and achieve a, a, some kind of productivity, you gain tremendously by reducing the overall system latency. So what we showed you here is our ability to exploit sparsity to provide low latency and hence translate it into higher productivity with the gray one chip. Now we've learned quite a bit by working with our customers. And so this is kind of a summary of some of the key aspects that we have learned over the past year. PilotNet is a relatively small model. As you can imagine, a lot of customers would want off the shelf models like ResNet 50, MobileNet SSD, depth algorithms that are available and the ability to take those networks and map them directly to your hardware. So you need adequate memory in your hardware to handle such off the shelf models. You of course need familiar tools for ease of development and interfaces that enable system level gains. So as I mentioned before, it's not just the inference latency that matters, but it's the overall system gain that you can achieve. So by combining the inference latency with interfaces that allow you to exploit that at a system level gives the end customer far greater benefits. And of course, at the end of the day, you want to minimize your form factor or size so that they can be deployed in a variety of different um, devices. So it's my pleasure to announce our next upcoming product, introducing the world's first data flow and sparsity enabled system on chip delivering ResNet 50 type inferences in less than a millisecond with batch size equals one. You heard it right. ResNet 50 type inferences in the order of millisecond or very low latency. This is soon coming to a development board near you. We'll be happy to share more details on our upcoming chip, including the interfaces, performance data, and how you can leverage these benefits at a system level. We have recently relaunched our website 
you can go to www at graymatterlabs.ai and we look forward to working with you and answering any questions you have both for our upcoming chip and also what we have today as a hardware development kit using Gray One. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I look forward to answering your questions.